So, this is an interesting segment, because when I was originally writing it down and adding it to my list of things to cover, it was actually going to be a negative story. But since I wrote it down, updates have occurred that have actually made the story a lot more positive. So instead of the original article I was going to cover that was, you know, not didn't exactly have the happiest of endings and left things on a pretty unhopeful note to say the least, we've actually got a different article to cover here that goes over the surprisingly happy ending to this situation. Certainly not an ending really, but resolution to this particular part of the situation. As you all know, for the last couple years, I've been doing some pretty good coverage of the situation in Ukraine, at least I would say. There are definitely people who have been covering it better than I, such as Dylan Burns, who has literally been on the ground in Ukraine and has been shelled by Russians uh, multiple times. If I had a nickel for every time Dylan Burns has been shelled by Russians, I'd have like four nickels, which is way too many for how, how many nickels you'd have for every time your friend got bombed by Russians, okay? Um, he is the GOAT. He is the GOAT of coverage of this war. But I've been covering it as well, and uh, obviously there has been uncritical support for Ukraine. There has been numerous attempts by the right, by dumbfuck lefties who want to support Russia, to defend Russia at every turn and to somehow demonize Ukraine. You guys remember when, like, for a whole year, supposedly every Ukrainian was a Nazi? You guys remember that? That talking point that's, like, gone away now because it never really had any, like, evidence for it in the first place? Remember when, like, every Ukrainian was a Nazi and, like, Russia was denazifying Ukraine? Remember that? Yeah, that was Second Thought and Hassan's argument. Yeah. Who, who remembers those talking points? Really good stuff. Well, since then, the U.S., as well as the rest of much of Europe, really, has been providing a substantial amount of lethal aid, military aid, to Ukraine because, goddamn, do they need it. They're fighting against Russia, and they're doing well, but things are not looking as good for Ukraine as they were a couple years ago. Don't get me wrong. Ukraine has held out extraordinarily well, and I truly am impressed, but, like... Ukraine is a much lesser power than Russia, and without backup, Ukraine would inevitably fail and fall to Russia in the long term. That's just what would happen without the backup of, you know, allies. That, that's just what would happen. So without more support, no doubt within a year, Ukraine would mostly be annexed by Russia. I genuinely believe that's what would happen. Um... But thankfully, Ukraine has had some pretty sustained support from the U.S. and other countries. The problem is, the most recent wave of support that was supposed to go to Ukraine didn't go through. It was being blocked. And there was this big question as to whether or not we would have an indefinite hold on support to Ukraine. And without the U.S., it would not look good. Ukraine has been doing amazingly. Yes, but at the same time, Orthers Dork, like... Like a couple months, like weeks ago, not even, not months ago, a couple weeks ago, I was reading an article from, um, I think NPR about how the tides were turning in Ukraine and things weren't looking good. But hopefully this update changes things. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that, but NPR doesn't generally lie or get things wrong. So regardless, here's the article. Fear not, U.S. military aid to Ukraine is coming. Despite the delay of further 61 billion of U.S. aid to Ukraine, enough to cover all of 2024, will still be approved. How can I be so confident? Because the vast majority of Republicans and Democrats in both houses of Congress support it, and nobody wants to vote on this again during a presidential election year. For all concerned, that means approval is better agreed upon sooner rather than later. Ukrainians and other U uh, Europeans are undeniably worried because as of mid-January, Congress still has not voted to approve the new p support package. According to former Ukrainian Minister of Defense, Andriy I'm going to do, do my best here. Zagarondinyuk. I think we got it there. The delay is beginning to be felt on the battlefield as the pace of ammunition supply slows. 
Yet this is not as often reported because of declining support for such aid in the United States generally, and among Republicans in particular. While it is true that support has dropped slightly since Russia's all-out war of aggression began nearly two years ago, at least 75% of members of Congress support the aid package, as do a good majority of the general public. Uh, the Reagan National Defen Defense Survey in November found that 59% of Americans support continuing military aid, the same number as in June and in November 2022. You know what's crazy, though? Most of the mil military aid is not in raw dollars, too. Like, I I maybe things would change with this particular spending bill, but as far as I know, up to this point, there has been no raw money sent to Ukraine, really, right? It's all been, like, old military equipment that we've been sending and when they say we've sent blank amount of dollars to ukraine it's like that's how much in ammo and guns and whatnot we've sent to ukraine right like th that it's a bit of a misnomer to say we've sent billions to ukraine when what we've sent is billions in unused gathering dust in a factory equipment oh has gonzalo lira died Coach Red Pill died in Ukraine? No shot, really? Pack watch real? On January 12th, 2024, Gonzalo Lira Sr., Lira's father, reported that his son had died in a Ukrainian prison at the age of 55. This was subsequently confirmed by the United States Department of State and Chile's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Lira Sr. blamed Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and U.S. President Joe Biden for causing his son's death. Kathy Young to, of The Bulwark criticized anti-Ukraine commentators for spreading misinformation about Lira and exploiting his death, while also issuing a call for transparency. Dude. Vosh has debated a dude who ended up fucking dead in a Ukrainian prison. That's crazy. Vosh debated this guy. I remember it. It was funny as fuck. I was like listening to it while playing uh, Metal Gear Solid Five when it happened. Like I just, I'm just thinking about the time Vosh debated that guy, and now he's like a cold body on the floor of a Ukrainian prison. Jesus, dude. For those that don't know, Coach Red Pill is this like really right wing piece of shit who would make content. Um, well, a lot of it was Red Pill content back before even Andrew Tate. He had that name before Andrew Tate blew up. The Red Pill stuff was, you know, an old meme before even that. And uh, he was doing pro-Russia news content in Ukraine. Like, I'm not, like, he went to Ukraine. He went to Kiev, went into, like, rented an apartment, and from an apartment in Kiev made videos about how, um, like, Ukraine is a false state and Russia is doing the right thing. Something that is a crime to do as a foreign person in a country that is being attacked and invaded, like making videos in support of the invaders is not legal. So he was arrested and then, um, yeah, I guess he died in prison. Dope. Oh yeah, he would report on battle positions too. Like he was actively trying to sabotage Ukraine in the war. Like he went there to learn things to like post to try to harm Ukraine's uh, ability to win. Yeah. No, he's like a real big piece of shit. If there's a hell, he's there right now. He was arrested as a foreign spy? Yeah, and rightly so, I would say. Damn, that's a pretty pog update on the Ukraine situation. Anyway, back to the article, I suppose. Majorities of both Republicans and Democrats agree that helping Ukraine is in the U.S. national interest. It just absolutely is. We have many, many countries we're allied with quite closely that need Ukraine to remain as a buffer nation between them and NATO. And on top of that, uh, Russia is just not a nation we're friendly with. Like, we don't want Russia to gain more power in their area of the world. That's not something that we are interested in happening for them, right? And then on top of that, like... Maybe it's because I live in a really progressive place, but it certainly feels like American support for Ukraine is high. Like, I go around, I mean, I'm walking around Seattle when this happens, but I walk around and there are Ukraine flags and, like, just all over every business, every house, like, bumper stickers, um, you know, just stickers on stoplights and on those little things you click to cross the street. Like, I, I see that shit all over the city where I live, and I saw it all over California, too, before I moved, so, like... From my experience, support for Ukraine has been pretty ubiquitous, at least in most progressive areas. I imagine among Democrat voters, there's pretty high support for continuing to help Ukraine. I don't, I don't think most American... 
I don't think most Americans want to see Ukraine lose this war. Yeah. Majorities of both Republicans and Democrats agree that helping Ukraine is in the U.S. national interest. Republican Senator Ma uh, Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Mike McCall, Mike Turner, and Mike Rogers all support the aid package. And House Speaker Mike Johnson has said he will support bringing it to a, fl to a floor vote that will surely be positive. So what's the delay? It is not disagreement over Ukraine, but over how to handle the tidal wave of illegal immigration washing over the U.S. southern border. Ah, it's because the the conservatives want to try and tie in to the bill. Okay, so for those that don't know, there is a practice that's very common in our government where a popular bill will be presented. And Republicans, sometimes Democrats, but 99% of the time it's Republicans who do this. Republicans will say, we like the bill, but here's the thing. We won't agree to it unless you include... A bunch of policies that only we like. And then we'll vote yes on the bill, even though we all like it. And they'll just refuse to do anything until those desires have been met. They'll just continue submitting requests for that to happen and keep a bill in, like, purgatory forever. Which puts pressure on the Democrats, or whatever the other side suggesting the bill is, because if they don't yield to these demands, then the bill never goes anywhere because they've it's been held hostage. Agreed, Zan. Um, current lack of Ukraine funding is not sustainable. Sooner or later, somebody something's going to have to give. Yeah. U.S. Customs and Border Protection recorded 2.5 million encounters with illegal migrants coming across the Mexico border in 2023, up from 2.2 million in 2022. That's what happens when we have such a strong economy. An average of more than 7,000 a day crossed in December for a total of 20 sorry, 2,225,000, the highest monthly total in more than two decades. And these are only those who are processed. Many more are never caught or, tra or tracked. This has led to ma major crises, not only in the U.S. border states such as Texas and Arizona, but in major cities across the country. Republicans in Congress are insisting that urgent action be taken to try and stem this flow. They argue that it is a politically unsustainable to tell their voters that they have to approve another $61 billion to help Ukraine recover its borders, while they have not done nearly enough to protect the U.S. border, unquote. So basically what the Republicans are trying to argue is that the U.S. border cities are in crisis due to illegal immigration, and you can't give money to Ukraine until we've secured our borders. So they're trying to use the, like, bullshit, the U.S. does not have secure borders argument. So, for those that don't know, by the way, I feel like it's worth mentioning this. Illegal immigration does not bring crime. Like, the, the overwhelming majority of both experts in crime and experts in the economy agree illegal immigration helps the economy and illegal immigrants commit less crime. So, well, unless you count the crime of legally immigrating, but like they don't commit crime once they've gotten to America, like way less than native born Americans. So it's a complete garbage argument. There's no, it's just a culture war thing. Notice how honestly most conservative pundits have actually started arguing that illegal immigration or just immigration at all isn't bad because of crime or the economy or anything like that because they really can't point to numbers that say as such in reality. They start arguing somehow it's it's diluting whiteness and, and destroying white culture somehow. It's destroying American culture. Like, they make arguments that are actually impossible to prove right or wrong that are just, they sound nice if you agree with them culture war arguments so you can't challenge them on a, on a, like a real solid statement. It's really cowardly, but I mean, you know, even in Congress, Republicans are doing this. 